Last week in fantasy football, we saw the likes of Tyrod Taylor, Mac Jones, and Gardner Minshew finish as top 10 fantasy quarterbacks. But I think at this point in my career, I am able to speak for the entire fantasy community when I say this. Hey, fantasy football. Well, with all that being said, I mean, I actually do feel, I feel a little bit better. I probably should have done that a little bit earlier because, man, I feel good now. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about quarterbacks once again here for week eight fantasy football. One thing we don't have to worry about this week, though, are bye weeks. There are no bye weeks, so we should have plenty of options available. Now, I don't know about you guys, but... Week seven was a little stressful for fantasy football, and it led to me making a few extra adult beverages, I guess you could say. But Monday morning was great. I woke up, destroyed the bathroom, got some coffee, worked out, did a cold plunge. I felt really good. And that's because Sunday night and Monday morning, I chose to be smart and use Waterboy. Now I gotta say, this is by far one of my favorite products that we've ever had here on this channel. It has zero sugar, zero caffeine, 10 calories and three times the electrolytes of its main competitor. It's something that can help rehydrate me and knock out that fatigue by giving me a boost of vitamins. I absolutely love it. All it takes, one packet and like 32 ounces of water and you're on your way to recovery. But like usual, I wanna give you more. So I wanna give you a discount on it right now. Head over to waterboy.com, find yourself a flavor you like. There's more than just one flavor. Then once you do find something you like, use promo code headliners at checkout for 15% percent off your order there are links down below in the description so once again waterboy.com find yourself something great get on the road to recovery and use promo code headliners at checkout for 15 percent off but now it's time to dive in to week eight more football that's probably going to stress us out once again let's move on to thursday night football the tampa bay buccaneers and buffalo bills and listen baker mayfield Hasn't been playing bad from a fantasy perspective, but he's a little bit more of an injury fill-in, a bye week fill-in at best. And with no buys this week, he's not really somebody that I'm considering in my lineup. He's the current quarterback 19 overall, averaging 15.7 fantasy points per game. Now, Tampa Bay, they throw the ball on average 32.6 times per game, which is only 24th in the NFL. The biggest issue here is he hasn't been able to find the end zone consistently. He has more turnovers than touchdowns over the last month of the season. And now you see a matchup going up against Buffalo. And they allow only 12.1 fantasy points per game, even though Mac Jones last week looked like Tom Brady with the Patriots against this Buffalo Bills defense. Buffalo has allowed over 250 yards passing now in three of their last four ball games. There's no new injuries in Tampa Bay. And even though Buffalo has hasn't really looked good since week four. This is going to be a game in prime time back at home in Buffalo. I look at Baker Mayfield as a little bit more of a mid to low end quarterback two option out there for those of you that play in two quarterback leagues. His opponent, Josh Allen. Now, one thing that's good about the Bills continuing to struggle and trying to catch up in the second half of ball games is it's leading to Josh Allen racking up the fantasy points. Right now, he is the number one overall quarterback, averaging 23.3 fantasy points per game. Allen has had at least two touchdowns now in every game of the season with the exception of week one. He's still not running a whole lot though, which is kind of concerning. He has less than 20 yards rushing in four straight games now. Where is that rushing upside that we used to see from Josh Allen? I'm sure it's because they're trying to keep him healthy for the entire season, but now they're going against Tampa Bay. They allow 15.7 fantasy points per game, and it's a team that really can give up some yards, but limits opponent scoring. They've only allowed over 20 points to an opponent one time all season. Now, when it comes to injuries in Buffalo, Dawson Knox going to have surgery on his wrist. He is doubtful to play. The rest of the major injuries on this team are on the defensive side of the football, but it's Josh Allen. Ain't nobody sitting Josh Allen in week eight of fantasy football. Now, let's head over to some Sunday football. We'll kick it off with the first game here, the Houston Texans and Carolina Panthers. And this is actually going to be a game that I'm at this weekend. So if you're going to be at the Panthers-Texans game, let me know down below in the comments section. But this is going to be a battle of two rookie quarterbacks, both coming off their bye week. But I think fantasy-wise, a lot of people are more excited about the return of C.J. Stroud than they are the return of Bryce Young. Right now, Stroud currently the 14th highest scoring quarterback 
quarterback in fantasy on a per game basis. He's thrown for two touchdowns in four of his last five games and still only has one interception on the season. Houston throws the ball quite a bit too, top 10 in the league, and they have the fifth fastest pace of play. Maybe you're like, what the hell does that matter, Jake? Well, if they're playing quickly, they're getting more plays into a game. More plays equal what? Yes, potentially more fantasy points. Plus, we know C.J. Stroud likes to go deep. 53.3% completion rate on his deep balls. That's the second highest of all quarterbacks in the NFL. Now a matchup going up against Carolina. They allow 13.2 fantasy points per game, but they are much easier to run on than they are to throw on. However, we should be getting back Tank Dell this week, which is a huge boost to C.J. Stroud. This offensive line, still not going to be 100%, though maybe a little bit better coming off the bye week, but it's not going to be great. Stroud has a chance to go into Carolina, though, and show them what they missed out on. A lot of people, myself included, believe that C.J. Stroud should have been the number one overall quarterback drafted going to the Carolina Panthers. That didn't happen, right? So I still look at C.J. Stroud as a fringe top 12 play here this week. His opponent, Bryce Young, It's not the same story for Bryce Young, right? Only one game all year with multiple touchdowns, looking more confident, but really just dink and dunking around the field. He's only averaging five air yards per attempt, not very far down the field. He's near the bottom of the league in deep ball attempts, red zone attempts, and yards per attempts, as well as fantasy points per drop back. The guy's just not going down the field enough to rack up large amounts of fantasy points. Now he's going against Houston. They're pretty solid against quarterbacks as well, allowing 14.4 fantasy points per game. Really waiting to see if we get Miles Sanders back to this offense, but honestly... Chuba been looking just fine, so that's not a huge factor there. The rest of the major injuries on defense in Carolina... This is just not a spot yet where Bryce Young is someone that we want to consider in a week with no bye weeks. I do like how we're seeing him improve week to week, but not a fantasy option for us here just yet. Which will then take us down to Dallas for the Cowboys and the Rams. And for Matthew Stafford, it is crazy to think that despite the games that we've seen here in recent memory from Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Tutu Atwell, whoever it may be, Matthew Stafford doesn't have one top 12 finish on the year yet at the quarterback position. The guy is basically allergic to touchdowns at this point. Only one game all year with multiple touchdowns just isn't going to cut it. And really, it's because they haven't thrown very much overall as an offense now in back-to-back ball games. Less than 30 pass attempts in two straight games is not really what you expect from a Los Angeles Rams offense led by Matthew Stafford. Now, with those lower passing attempts, you have to think he's not throwing for as many yards, and you're correct. He hasn't thrown for over 231 yards now in three straight games, but he hasn't been bad. He's just been average, kind of similar to what we were talking about a little bit earlier with Baker. Mayfield. Stafford right now averaging 15.2 fantasy points per game. Now they have a matchup going up against Dallas, who's pretty solid against quarterbacks. They're allowing only 12.2 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. That's fourth fewest in the league. Plus, they have only allowed over 275 total yards two times all year, and they're coming off their bye week where they had an extra week to prep for this game. When it comes to injuries, nothing new or major for the Los Angeles Rams. And the last time we saw Matthew Stafford go up against this Dallas defense, he threw for 300 yards and a touchdown. But even that, not a high ceiling game. I'm still looking at Matthew Stafford as a higher end quarterback, too, for me here this week outside of my top 12. His opponent, Dak Prescott. But what's crazy here is Dak is kind of in the same spot as Matthew Stafford. Not playing bad. Just can't get in the end zone very much. Only six passing touchdowns through six games played for Dak Prescott and no games so far this season with over 300 yards passing. And it's really in the red zone where they are struggling right now. And I say that because Dak Prescott has 40 red zone pass attempts. That's good enough for second most among all quarterbacks in the NFL yet he's 22nd overall in passing touchdowns. So he's getting to the red zone, but he's not throwing it in the end zone. However, before the bye week, he did have a season high in rushing, which definitely helped us. Seven carries, 40 yards, and a rushing touchdown. But now going up against LA, they allow 16.7 fantasy points per game. No new injuries there for Dallas. It's just another quarterback that we just haven't seen a consistent ceiling for week in and week out. So with no bye weeks, I look at Dak Prescott as another one of those 
those mid to high end quarterback twos just outside the top 12 this week as well. How about we go down to Minnesota and Green Bay? Now let's kick it off with Kirk Cousins. Look at primetime Big Kirko out there on the San Francisco defense. He finished as quarterback six overall on the week. He's now quarterback six overall on the year. And for the first time without Justin Jefferson on the field, Kirk Cousins not only looked confident, but he looked decisive. He looked great in Monday Night Football. He's now had multiple touchdowns in all but one game this season, and the emergence of Jordan Addison is a huge reason why. The kid just has huge touchdown upside each and every week. Now a matchup going up against Green Bay. They allow 14.7 fantasy points per game, and they are way easier to run on Green Bay than they are to throw on Green Bay. But as of right now, we also don't know if Green Bay is going to have defensive back Jair Alexander back and available this week in week eight. When we talk about the Vikings, though, there's no new major injuries. Green Bay is a tough team to pass on, but so was San Francisco last week. And look what Big Kirko did. Minnesota is starting to gain a little bit of confidence. And as a team that we've seen go on runs before, Big Kirko got to be on the verge of being top 12 once again here this week. His opponent, Jordan Love. He didn't play bad, but it's really apparent that this Green Bay offense is just a little bit to vanilla. It's kind of boring in Green Bay right now. Jordan Love has two touchdowns in all but one game this season. He's the current quarterback 11 overall and averaging almost 19 fantasy points per game. He just needs more yardage. Green Bay ranks 26th in pass attempts per game though. He's not getting a whole lot of opportunity to rack up that yardage. Now luckily, Love is airing it out when he does throw the football. He's 6th in the league in deep ball attempts and number 1 in the league in air yards per attempt. He's throwing the ball deep down the field. Now, Minnesota is typically a team that you can take advantage of through the air, but we saw San Francisco struggle in that area just a little bit just last week. Plus, the Green Bay Packers right now are pretty beat up. Christian Watson, he appeared to suffer some sort of a knee injury late in week seven. That's something we're paying close attention to. Tight end Luke Musgrave, he left in a walking boot. Now, normally I would say that we would want Jordan Love to have those options available if he was going to be considered for fantasy football here this week. But those two last week, they only combined for 57 yards total. It's not like they're carrying their team's offense, but it's definitely going to lower the potential ceiling of Jordan Love. He's going to be a verge top 12 guy just for the touchdown upside alone, but we would really like to see a healthy Christian Watson and Luke Musgrave in this offense. All right, how about we go down to New Orleans and Indianapolis now? We'll start off in New Orleans with Derek Carr, and he's coming off his highest point total of the season with 18.4 fantasy points in week seven, finishing as the overall quarterback eight. But I will say this, he was greatly helped out by 14 yards rushing and a two point conversion. A lot of people are like, why does that really matter? That's only three points. Those three points, technically 3.4 points, are the difference of him finishing as quarterback 8 or quarterback 15. And those two things are not something we rely upon weekly from Derek Carr, but overall he does look fairly healthy. He does now also have over 17 fantasy points in back-to-back -back ball games. But the biggest issue is this. He's third overall among all quarterbacks in air yards per attempt. So he's throwing the ball deeper down the field. But he's also... 29th in yards per attempt, which means he's throwing the ball deep down the field, but there's too many missed shots, too many incompletions. Now a matchup going up against Indianapolis. They allow 16.8 fantasy points per game, which is right around the league average. However, over the last two weeks, they've held both Jacksonville and Cleveland to under 175 yards passing. No new injuries here in New Orleans. They could be getting back tight end Juwan Johnson soon, but really when I look at this team, the X factor for me is this. Is it just me or does Derek Carr and his wide receivers, something just seems off. There's always miscommunications. Derek Carr seems to be frustrated on the field visibly multiple times each and every week. That and every other play in this offense is a check down to Alvin Kamara. When I look at Derek Carr, he's another mid to low end quarterback option for those two quarterback leagues at best this week. His opponent, it's Gardner Minshew. And talk about some damn Minshew magic. He had four four turnovers last week against the Cleveland Browns. Now you would think with four turnovers against that Cleveland defense, he would be doomed. No. 
He went out and threw for 305 yards, two touchdowns and an interception, and had 29 yards rushing and two rushing touchdowns for Gardner Minshew. Minshew hadn't had a game all year, over 13 fantasy points in a game. Then he goes up against the number one defense in the NFL and goes for 28. Now, he did benefit from two big plays. One was the result of a free play due to a penalty. The second one was like a broken tackle, missed coverage type play, a big touchdown to Michael Pittman. But still, now they're going up against New Orleans. They allow 14.7 fantasy points per game. It's another tough defense to go up against. They haven't allowed over 245 passing yards in a game this season yet. Tight end Kylan Granson, he's still banged up. And as much as I love to watch Gardner Minshew play, we all know he's going to air it out a ton. That's going to lead to turn turnovers. Eight turnovers over the last two weeks. If this dude doesn't go out there and score multiple touchdowns, he is absolutely going to doom your team with all of those negative plays. Going to be another one of those quarterback two guys for me this week. How about New England and Miami will kick it off in New England with Mac Jones. And really here as of late, he's gone from a guy who was on the verge of being benched weekly on an offense that struggled to score to what we just saw in week seven. Coming into week seven, the Patriots only scored over 17 points one time all year. Then they go on to score 29 and beat the Buffalo Bills. Now, Mac Jones had only two touchdowns total since week one and then had two more in week seven alone. And he actually looked pretty freaking good. He converted 83% of his passes and for the first time all season, averaged over 10 air yards per attempt. He wasn't just dink and dunking. He was completing passes deeper down the field. Now a matchup going up against Miami, he's going to need to do that again because Miami allows 19.4 fantasy points per game. That's seventh most in the league. We know he still doesn't have Juju, but he really hasn't had him all year long. There's multiple injuries on defense, but offensive wise, they should be pretty good in New England. In a week with no buys though, can we really, can anyone out there really justify starting Mac Jones in fantasy football? There has been way more bad this year than there has been good. And until we see him become a little bit more consistent, he's not going to be in my fantasy lineup. As for Tua, the current quarterback five overall, averaging 19.6 fantasy points per game, but he is coming off his worst game of the season. It looked like losing Jalen Waddle for about half of that ball game in week seven really seemed to derail the overall passing game in Miami. But he's still leading the league in passing yards. He's still leading the league in passing touchdowns, and he's already faced this defense one time this year back in week two where he had 249 yards passing one touchdown one interception which makes a lot of sense because this is still a very solid defense in New England they allow 14.5 fantasy points per game but it's also worth noting over his career Tua has never had a game against the New England Patriots where he's had more than one passing touchdown so do with that as you will now this offensive line of Miami it's getting pretty thin they just lost offensive tackle Isaiah Wynn for a few weeks as well in week seven but they could be getting back defensive back Jalen Ramsey which would be a big boost to this overall defense plus it also sounds like Jalen Waddle should be good to go in week eight with the ceiling of this offense it makes it really too hard to sit any of these pieces this may not be a ceiling game for Tua but still a low-end quarterback one one for me this week. Now, let's head down to the New York Jets and New York Giants. And listen, we still don't even know if we're going to have Daniel Jones in this ball game. but if we do, does it really matter? He's not going to be 100% healthy, and the offensive line is all hurt. Maybe we still have Tyrod Taylor. That doesn't matter to me either, because they're going up against a Jets defense that had an extra week to prepare against them. Are we starting Zach Wilson? No, we're not doing that either. We have two very low-ceiling quarterbacks that both play in bottom 10 NFL offenses. Both of these teams easier to run on than they are to throw on, and I would rather either one of these guys go off on my waiver wire than to score 10 points in my starting lineup. So we're not considering either of the guys here in this matchup in a week like this. How about we go down to Jacksonville and Pittsburgh? And for Trevor Lawrence, he's coming off his best fantasy day that he's had since week one. We can really thank the rushing upside for that one, too. He had a season-high 59 yards rushing, and without that, he would have been outside the top 20 quarterbacks on the week. Still no rushing touchdowns on the season, and he's yet to throw for two touchdowns in a game against anyone in the league 
except the Indianapolis Colts. They just can't seem to get in the red zone. Trevor Lawrence only has 18 red zone pass attempts this season. That ranks 27th in the NFL. Now a matchup going up against Pittsburgh, who allows 16.3 fantasy points per game. Really has been one of those bend but not break style defenses over the last month of the season. We're still waiting to see whether or not Zay Jones is going to return for this offense, but he has more than enough weapons at his disposal to put up 18 fantasy points per week. We we just haven't seen it consistently. He is, once again, going to be a verge top 12 guy for me here in week eight. But when you're looking at verge top 12 quarterbacks right now, we're talking about 16 points a week or so. We're not blowing the doors off things with all 12 quarterbacks inside the top 12. His opponent, Kenny Pickett. And for Kenny Pickett, just picture Trevor Lawrence except a quarterback that scores even less fantasy points. And that's going to be Kenny Pickett. He's only gone over 18 fantasy points one time all year, only one game all year with multiple touchdowns, and has absolutely zero, none, nada, no rushing upside. This guy has 12 yards rushing through six games. I've never seen a quarterback that has this type of mobility that just does not use it ever. Now, no, Kenny Pickett isn't Lamar Jackson, but he definitely has the ability to move the ball with his feet. He just never really does. But you have to think that Deontay Johnson, now in his second game back, is only going to help Kenny Pickett. Going up against Jacksonville, they allow 19 fantasy points per game. That's seventh most in the league. He did just lose his tight end, who was put on IR, Pat Fryermuth, but I really want to believe in Kenny Pickett. But there is no way I can put him in my top 12 for the this week. I don't, I not with every team playing, not with no bye weeks, but I will say this. He probably will be the highest he's been ranked in a while. That being said, he's still only going to be a mid quarterback two for me this week. All right. How about we go down to Atlanta and Tennessee? We'll start it off here with Atlanta. And for Desmond Ritter, had he not slowed down and just like olayed it into the end zone towards the end of that game in week seven, he would have had yet another top 10 finish on the season at the position instead of a top 20 overall finish. If you missed it, he literally tried to like slow down as he was going into the end zone. A defender knocked it out of his hands. It went through the end zone and was a turnover touchback. That is not what you want to see when you're this close to six rushing points for your quarterback. It would have been his third straight game with over 19 fantasy points. He's really been helping his fantasy cause, though, on the ground here as of late. Rushing touchdowns in two of his last three ball games, but this dude just needs to protect the ball better. Six turnovers over his last two games, and that absolutely terrifies me if you're wanting to start him going forward. Now they're going up against Tennessee, who's coming off their bye week and has really been playing better overall on defense leading up to their bye week. When it comes to injuries, Bijan Robinson... That whole situation, shady AF, am I right? But do I hate Ritter this week? No. Do I want to start him in a week with no quarterbacks on by? No. I mean, I really don't. But he will, however, make it inside my top 24 overall quarterbacks. Now, for Tennessee... We don't even know who their quarterback is going to be yet, right? Is it Malik Willis? Is it Will Levis? What we do know is it's probably not going to be Ryan Tannehill, who's still dealing with a major high ankle sprain, but neither one of these backup quarterbacks in Tennessee are going to be fantasy viable for us here. This I wouldn't start a healthy Ryan Tannehill in this matchup. I'm not starting one of the backups in one of the worst passing offenses in all of the NFL, not considering that. So let's move on to Philadelphia and Washington now. We'll start off with Jalen Hurts, who continues his hot streak. He hasn't had less than 21 fantasy points in a game now since week one. He just faced this Washington defense back in week four, had 319 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and 34 yards rushing. Washington allows over 21 fantasy points per game, which is second most in the league, and we all know that Jalen Hurts had some type of minor injury in week seven, but all reports are coming out that he should be 100% good to go. With his recent play and this match up Jalen Hurts may be might just be my overall quarterback one on the week. His opponent, Sam Howell. He's currently quarterback nine overall on the season and coming off one of his worst games of the season. This Washington offense is just it's dumb. 
Uh, and that's the only thing that I can say. Offensive coordinator Eric Bieniemy is acting like he's still calling plays for Patrick Mahomes in a Kansas City offense, and he's not adapting to the players and the style that they have in Washington. If this team would just run the ball a little bit more, their offense would be in a much better spot. Now, I know their offensive line isn't great, but you have to have some sort of balance here in this offense. They just go out there and gunsling it so much that they end up putting their defense in really bad positions. They're not trying to control time of possession at all. And that's putting their defense on the field way too many times. They're giving up way too many points because we already know that defense struggles. And then they're constantly having to try to play from behind. And it's just not the type of offense they have. Then you add in the fact that Sam Howell is on record to be the most sacked quarterback of all time in the NFL. And it's just a recipe for disaster. But now they're going up against Philadelphia, who has 17.6 fantasy points per game. In this matchup, last time Howell had 290 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions, and 40 yards rushing back in week four. This offense just has to stop trying to look good and just move the ball. Use the short passing game. We saw that a couple weeks ago with Logan Thomas and Curtis Samuel. It worked out great, and then they just abandoned it. Run the ball to start the game. Try to control the line of scrimmage. Get yourself more scoring opportunities. Control the time of possession. Without doing all that, you don't have the type of offense and the type of quarterback of a Patrick Mahomes where you can continually go out and play from behind the way they do each and every week. I love Sam Howell. He is a verge top 12 quarterback for me due to this matchup alone. I just have very little faith in the Washington coaching staff at this point, and that leads to a whole lot of headaches and more water boy. All right, let's move down to Cleveland and Seattle. Now let's kick it off with Deshaun Watson. And I don't care what Cleveland says, right? I'm not going to trust it going forward. I want to see it on the field and I'm going to ignore everything else. Because last week, Deshaun Watson did not look healthy. His arm strength wasn't there and every ball that he threw was underthrown. He then left the game to be checked out for a concussion, passed concussion protocol, but they didn't put him back into the game. What sense does that make? That tells me that he was never healthy enough to even play in the first part. And if that's the case, I have no interest in starting him in fantasy football until I can see him on the field and playing well. I don't care how great this matchup is. Seattle allows over 17 fantasy points per game. But Deshaun Watson, I don't even know if he can complete a five-yard slant right now. I will gladly take the risk of him going off on my bench or on my waiver wire before I risk throwing him into my lineup again. Once he starts to score points again, once he starts to look a little bit better, then sure, we'll consider it. But going forward, my, my answer to this question for Deshaun Watson is going to remain the same. I have zero interest in starting him until I see him 100% on the field. All right, now let's go to his opponent, Geno Smith. And finally, Geno was able to throw for two touchdowns in a game once again, first time since week two of the season. I guess all he needed was to not have DK Metcalf on the field, I guess, because, you know, that makes total sense. But he also does have four turnovers over his last two games. He's not protecting the ball as well this year as he did last year, but let's not get too excited. He still didn't even score over 15 fantasy points last week. He's only finished top 12 of the position one time all season. Now he's going up against Cleveland, who allows 14 fantasy points per game. And up until last week, they hadn't allowed over 200 yards passing in a game all season long. Then Gardner Menchu comes, puts up some big numbers due to some broken plays, and that kind of skews these numbers just a little bit. We do not know whether or not DK Metcalf is going to make it back as of right now for week eight, something we're paying close attention to. But with the lack of production, the tough matchup, and a big weapon really banged up in this offense, you look at Geno Smith as more of a top 20 option and not a top 12 option. Which will then take us out to Arizona for the Cardinals and Baltimore Ravens. We'll kick it off with Lamar Jackson. And I feel like up until week seven, I've been having to defend the play of Lamar Jackson way too much. We even had this comment on a video last week that got 48 likes on it and a ton of people agreeing with the comment that Lamar Jackson is killing them. I just don't get that. Because as of right now, Lamar Jackson is the current quarterback for overall. He's only scored under 18 points one time since week one. He's averaging 21 fantasy points per game. And with the rushing numbers, he's averaging over 280 total yards per contest and has 13 touchdowns in seven games. 
Yeah, I know he had a great week seven, but even the prior six weeks weren't bad. I don't know what people were complaining about, but now he's got a matchup going up against Arizona, which is great. They allow almost 20 fantasy points per game, fourth most in the league. No other major injuries in Baltimore, and with as good as Lamar Jackson has been playing, be thankful that you drafted him and just start him every single week. His opponent, Josh Dobbs. And for the magic that Josh Dobbs had to start the season... I think it's all but gone at this point. No passing touchdowns now in back-to-back ball games. Hasn't thrown for over 250 yards in a game since week four. Now that rushing upside that he has is helping, but his ceiling has dramatically fallen. We also know that Kyler Murray is on his way back. Reports are coming out that he could start in the week 10 ball game for the Arizona Cardinals. But with the recent struggles, there is no way, no No way that I'm trusting Josh Dobbs against this Baltimore Ravens defense who allows only 10.5 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. That's second fewest in the league and no opponent has scored 20 points on them in a game in a month. There's no new major injuries in Arizona, but at this point, just stash Kyler Murray if you need to for a potential end of season run. But the days of thinking that Josh Dobbs is a fantasy option is all but over. All right, but now let's head up to Denver for the Broncos and the Chiefs. We'll start off with Patrick Mahomes because there's nothing that I can really say here that you don't already know. Patrick Mahomes, the current quarterback, three overall in fantasy football, averaging just over 22 fantasy points per game, and just had his first four-touchdown passing game of the season. Also love having those 25-plus rushing yards in all but one game so far this year. We have seen him against this Denver team already this season though, and he didn't exactly go off, right? He had 306 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Now gets to go against Denver again, who allows over 20 fantasy points per contest, third most in the league. No other new major injuries here for Kansas City, but you got to think that Pat is going to try to keep this momentum that we saw him start with last week. If that's the case, Look out, we could be seeing a huge run coming from Patrick Mahomes, especially with the likes of Rasheed Rice starting to step up in this offense. We already know we start Pat. What about Russell Wilson? For Russ, we for sure need to see him do better than what he did last time against Kansas City. When they played just a couple weeks ago, Russ only threw for 95 yards. Is that right? That's got to be a typo. That's got to. Let me look it up here real quick. Let me look it up. Russell. Holy crap. That's right. He only threw for 95 yards in their last matchup. That's now three straight games with sub 200 yards passing for Russell Wilson. Because once you really notice that he's had just as many touchdowns as turnovers over the last two weeks, you kind of start to panic because it's the touchdowns that's been saving Russell Wilson all season long. He has 13 passing touchdowns. That's fifth most in the league. He's quarterback eight overall on the season in fantasy football But honestly, that seems kind of fraudulent to me, especially once we've seen these back-to-back duds from him. Then we add on the fact that he's going up against this Kansas City defense again, who allows only 13.7 fantasy points per contest, eighth fewest in the league, and things just aren't adding up for a great Russell Wilson week. No other new major injuries here as well. But with all the quarterbacks available to us on this slate this week, I don't even know if Russell Wilson's going to make my top 20 on the week. His risk is climbing week by week, and with no bye weeks on the schedule, I don't know if we're going to start Russell Wilson here this week. All right, now let's move on to Cincinnati and San Francisco, my manscaped matchup of the week. And in case you haven't noticed, it's almost Halloween, which means it's almost Thanksgiving, and then Christmas is right around the corner. The last thing you want to do is procrastinate when it comes to gift buying. Trust me, I can speak from experience. Now is the time to head over to manscaped.com. Find a few early Christmas presents. Get them knocked out early here in the holiday season. Because you definitely want to take advantage of getting a discount as well. Use referral code HEADLINERS at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. And they got this new product that I know a lot of people probably out there could take advantage of. It's the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, right? We all, we're all familiar with the Lawnmower, but everybody thinks it's just about your junk. Not always the case. Now they have this new attachment. Let me read it. It says an interchangeable dual head system. Use our skin safe trimmer blade to take a little off the top, then go with the skin safe foil blade to give it a smooth finish. That thing, that's a game changer right there. I know a lot of people can benefit from one of those, so make sure you get one of those at a discount. Use referral code HEADLINERS at checkout. Let's go ahead and get into this matchup because we got Joe Burrow against Brock Purdy. We'll kick it off with Joe Burr, who's currently coming off his bye week, and he really started to look a little bit healthier in the two games prior to his bye. So you have to think that going forward, we should be close to full go Joe Burrow. He had two touchdowns in the first month of the season overall. He's had five touchdowns in his last two games played, and we can talk all we 
we want to about primetime Kirk Cousins, but he just carved up this San Francisco defense. They are vulnerable through the air, which is exactly what we want to have for Joe Burrow. This Bengals team is a team that needs to start gaining some momentum. How do you do that? You throw the ball a lot to Jamar Chase T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and anyone else on the roster that wants to catch some balls. Now, right now, we don't know for sure whether or not T. Higgins is going to be close to 100%. However, he did play in the game prior to the bye week, so he should be good to go and active in this game. You have to think, though, that San Francisco wants to right the ship, right? They've lost two straight games, and this game is going to be in San Francisco, so it's not going to be easy, but Burrow is going to probably be at the bottom half of my top 12 quarterbacks here this week. With the way that we saw him play, in those two games prior to the bye, we already know what the potential ceiling is of Joe Burrow. Sure, the passing yardage may be down a little bit, but if we can continue to get multiple touchdown games, he's really going to help our fantasy football team. And like I said, he'll be verge top 12 this week for Brock Purdy. And we're really starting to see Brock Purdy have to deal with a little bit of adversity for the first time in his NFL career. He's now lost back-to-back -back games, but you can really tell that he not only misses Debo Samuel, he also misses all-world offensive lineman Trent Williams. I don't care how good your team is, when you lose an offensive lineman like that, it's going to make a difference. But now he gets to go back home to San Francisco, where he really does play better and try to bounce back a little bit with hopefully some more weapons at his disposal. Because up until recently, Brock Purdy has been pretty freaking solid in fantasy football. I'm not going to look at two down games with some missing weapons and all of a sudden write this guy off for the rest of the season. Now he's going up against Cincinnati. They allow 13.6 fantasy points per game, but really all eyes are on the injury room, right? Do we get back Trent Williams? Do we get back Debo Samuel? Because with those two guys back in the lineup, it makes Brock Purdy a verge top 12 guy each and every week in fantasy football for the most part. There is going to be some risk right now with the unknown of these injuries, but you have to think that Cincinnati, with an extra week to prepare for this matchup and what they just saw Minnesota do against this defense, that Brock Purdy and the San Francisco 49ers are going to have their hands full with the Cincinnati Bengals forcing Brock Purdy to have to throw the ball all four quarters. Like I said, he will be verge top 12 for me this week. Which will then take us to Sunday Night Football, the Chicago Bears, Los Angeles Chargers. And let's just talk about Tyson Badgett for a second. This guy, I absolutely love to watch play football. The kid is absolutely legit, but his fantasy ceiling is going to be limited with as much as Chicago is going to run the ball going forward. He really plays with a lot of confidence, and that's what I absolutely love. That's what really makes him really fun to watch. He's just putting it all out there on the field. like He has nothing to lose. Now, He's going to get a great matchup here this week. The Los Angeles Chargers allow over 24 fantasy points per game, the most in the NFL to opposing quarterbacks, and we could be getting back Roshan Johnson. Not that it really matters because Dante Foreman out there looking like an all-world running back anyway. I really want to see Tyson Badgett go off on Sunday Night Football. I think that would be one of the best things to watch. But when it comes to fantasy football, it's just a little bit too much risk for me to want to trust him. If you're in a two-quarterback league and you just want to slap it down on the table for your league mates, I don't hate Tyson Badgent this week. He's just not somebody I can consider in a one-quarterback league, but I really hope, I'm really hoping this kid goes off. His opponent, Justin Herbert of the Los Angeles Chargers. It's a great matchup for Herbert too, right? He's currently the quarterback seven overall, averaging over 21 fantasy points per game and did just have his first game of the season with only one touchdown, but that really wasn't a surprise going against Kansas City. We talked about how good that defense is and how they could limit the upside of Justin Herbert, but he's currently top five among all quarterbacks in the NFL in deep ball attempts, red zone attempts, and fantasy points per game. Now he gets Chicago, who allows over 19 fantasy points per contest. He may not have Gerald Everett, but he still does have plenty of other options at his disposal. Josh Palmer, he's been playing really good here as of late. He's been making up for the loss of Mike Williams just fine. Justin Herbert, we already know, a top 12 option each and every week. All right, now it's Monday Night Football, the Las Vegas Raiders and Detroit Lions. And let's just start off in Las Vegas because this one should be fairly easy. There's a lot of unknown on who the quarterback's even going to be. Does Jimmy G make it back from a back injury here into week eight? Regardless, it doesn't really matter. I'm not starting a quarterback for the Las Vegas Raiders here in week eight. The Lions were just dismantled and embarrassed by the Ravens last week. Now Detroit's going to be back at home in primetime television against an inferior opponent. 
I have a feeling Detroit's going to try to wipe the map with the Las Vegas Raiders here this week. Now, it's not a bad matchup for Las Vegas, right? Detroit allows over 18 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. But when we look at injuries here, aside from Jimmy G, the secondary is pretty banged up in Las Vegas. And I do expect Jared Goff to try to take advantage of that. Not to mention... Josh McDaniels may be one of the worst head coaches overall in the NFL. Hit the like button if you agree. His offense absolutely blows. His inability to adapt to a game, it's absolutely apparent each and every week. Players are starting to get frustrated. I'm just not interested here in the quarterbacks of the Las Vegas Raiders. As for the Detroit Lions and Jared Goff, I am way more interested in Jared Goff this week. He's currently the quarterback seven overall in fantasy football. And despite coming off his worst game of the year, I'm not scared off of him at all. The Baltimore defense is really good, and Detroit is pretty banged up on defense. We've already talked about that. However, Jared Goff still has multiple touchdowns in four of their seven games played. He's had at least two-plus touchdowns in all of their home games this season. He plays much better at home. This is something we've talked about now for multiple years. It's not a fluke. It's just what happens year in and year out. Now, Las Vegas only allows 15.6 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks, which isn't bad, but like we just mentioned, their secondary is pretty banged up right now. The Lions, though, they aren't healthy either. We know about David Montgomery, but the majority of their other injuries are going to be on defense. Really, it all comes down to the bounce back opportunity for the Detroit Lions in primetime football. And I really trust the coaching abilities of Dan Campbell a lot more than I trust the coaching abilities of the Las Vegas Raiders. The Detroit Lions are a very good team still, despite what we saw in week seven. And Jared Goff's going to be a top 12 option for me this week as well. All right, that's going to do it for my starts and sits for the quarterback position here, Week 8 Fantasy Football. Hopefully, I was able to give you a little bit of information to start making some of those early Week 8 decisions. Just a reminder, our rankings will be out Thursday morning to make any final decisions that you may have. But I want to wish everyone good luck here for Week 8 Fantasy Football. Now is the time where we make our run to the playoffs. So do me a favor, hit the like button on your way out. Consider subscribing if you still haven't already. Why not? Why haven't you subscribed already? It's Week 8, but I'm going to go ahead and get out of here for the day. Hopefully, you guys enjoy the rest of your day and then do your part to make the world a better place. I'm a headliner.